Hey everyone, today on The Final Bar, we'll do our wrap of the week. We will focus on how the markets have evolved from last Friday to this Friday. We'll focus on the message the markets provide back to us as we analyze the charts. I think today and really into next week, it's the question of whether or not this is a big double top for the S&P 500 or whether next week begins this push onward and ever upward to new all-time highs next week and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Friday edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close, and especially on a Friday here as we focus on how the markets have evolved. We focus on the, uh, the, the, the trajectory of the week and what the uh, conditions are for equities and other asset classes. As I mentioned in the, uh, in the brief introduction, the S&P testing new all-time highs. Yesterday, we accelerated to the upside, closed right around 45.50 with a lot of demand going into the closing bell. Today, a little more measured, a little choppier, sort of opened a little, a little higher, but settled in not far from where we ended yesterday's session. So we really haven't had that upside follow through yet. Remember, when you approach a previous high, a couple of things you're looking for. Number one, do you get above the high? That's step one. Step two, which is a really important one, do you follow through? And that's what we've not seen with Bitcoin, right? You got to 65,000, went a little bit higher, but now we've come right back down. So you haven't had that upside follow through, that indication that it's not just a fluke, that there's enough momentum to push us much, much higher. Now, what's interesting is on individual names, we're seeing some of the, that momentum in breadth conditions. We're seeing some improvement. We'll look at all those charts and more during the course of today's show. We have great guests on the show. Had a lot of fun this week talking to people like Craig Johnson and Katie Stockton and Miss Schneider, three real fantastic guests this week. Next week, more solid guests for you. On the 26th, on Tuesday, we have Roman Bogomasov from Wyckoff Analytics. On Wednesday, the 27th, Pat Ceresna, co-host of the Market Huddle podcast. And then on Thursday, Doug Bush from Chart Smarter in New York. Also, as a reminder, our latest episode of The Pitch is coming up next week on Wednesday, the 27th. That is our stock picking showdown. Grayson Rose from Stock Charts is going to moderate that discussion featuring Mark Newton, Greg Schnell, Jay Woods. All of them will bring five ideas each. They'll each pitch their ideas to you and discuss them as a team. It's a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun uh, with our last episode of The Pitch uh, a couple of weeks ago. You can go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch to see a preview of that upcoming episode and all of our previous episodes. You can see what stocks they were talking about and think about what has happened since then. So go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch. Let's continue on with our Wrap the Week segment. This is really the core of our Friday uh, show. We want to start briefly with a poll. And what we asked you is sort of a tongue-in-cheek-like question, but I'll tell you why we asked this question. Which of the Uniteds performs best over the next three months? And I gave you four stocks that have the word United in their name. UAL, United Airlines. UPS, United Parcel Service. UNH, United Health Group and Healthcare. And then Manchester United, Man U, M-A-N-U. I am thrilled as a Tottenham fan uh, who will be facing Man U, I believe, tomorrow morning in the wee hours uh, um, uh, Pacific time zone, uh, or maybe Sunday morning, I think it is. Uh, I'm glad only 4% of you went with Manchester United. That, that's good. Uh, but overall, most of you, I, I was almost uh, half of you voted UPS and second to that uh, United Health Group. You know, it's interesting, two actually pretty pretty decent charts. I don't disagree with the, with the two of those sort of me at the top. United Health Group actually hit my radar for stocks making new uh, swing highs this week. So when I do 52-week, uh, sorry, three-month highs uh, in the middle of the week, I usually scream for three-month highs and three-month lows. Uh, out of those four, UNH is probably the strongest in terms of its current trend. Almost half of you said UPS, and I get the argument. It's pulled back to the 200-day moving average. While stocks like Facebook are floundering at their 200-day, UPS is rotating higher. I would say for the overall stability of the market, UPS doing well is certainly usually a pretty good sign for the overall economic conditions because it tells you that people are ordering things and getting them shipped to their houses. I would probably pick UNH, but I tend to go for uh, stocks making new highs more than anything. Uh, but I, I appreciate you guys answering the poll. Why do we have that as a poll question? There was actually 
a, uh, a number of charts in the old Fidelity chart. And this is back in like the 1970s. And they had a, a chart called the Generals. And it was General Electric, General Motors, General Reinsurance, and a couple others that all had the word general in their name. And this is like a substitute for the Dow. This is the chart they would use to measure or to gauge overall economic strength, these big industrial uh, companies that were uh, that were really the economy or, or a, a shortcut for understanding the economy. So that is a tongue-in-cheek adaptation of that uh, of that chart, the generals. Let's continue on with our Wrap the Week segment. So a couple of things we like to do every, every Friday. Number one, look at how the markets have evolved in the last five, uh, five trading days. So here we're looking from last Friday, October 15th to this Friday, October 22nd, what has happened to the S&P and the major asset classes. So interesting on our asset allocation chart, the top performer was indeed the S&P. The S&P up 1.7%. A lot of that driven by the strength, uh, you know, Thursday really into the close. It really propelled uh, this, uh, this tape higher, but Overall, still finishing it with a little bit of a brief pullback today. Overall, finishing up 1.7%. Everything else on our list actually underperformed large cap stocks this week. Let's go in order from the S&P up 1.7%. Next down is uh, crude oil prices using the USO. That was up 1.5%. Also 1.5%, right about the same amount, was uh, gold, the GLD. Then in pink, you actually have uh, the NASDAQ 100. It was the top performer as of Thursday's close, but came off today. So you had communication services, the worst of the 10 S&P sectors. Uh, and so that's uh, sort of why that deteriorated, ended up finishing below a couple of the other things. Further from that, we have small caps up 1%. We have uh, emerging markets up 0.2%. It's really flat for the week. The last two were down for the week. The dollar index using the U, uh, dollar sign UUP, or actually just UUP, it's the uh, bullish dollar ETF down a third of a percent for the week. And then in red, you have bond prices down 0.6%. You know, I was writing a note for my premium members at Market Misbehavior earlier today, and we talked about interest rates. And I think I have very little doubt that we're in a rising rate environment. I don't think the 10-year yield is done going higher. It can certainly back and fill in this area, but overall, you're certainly seeing uh, all the indications of further upside for rates uh, inflationary pressures, all these things that we've uh, we've sort of been talking about off and on for you know for months now. Uh, but overall, I think rates going higher. One of the main uh, storylines there is the uh, is the upside potential for banks. And you've seen some of the bank stocks this week after a number of them reported last week. Stocks like BAC, uh, you know, going to new highs is certainly uh, uh, you know pretty impressive sign of uh, of strength. And and BAC is one of those that. You know, pulled back June, July, rotated a little back higher August, September, and then just this nice little shallow rotation. It took about a six month stretch basing pattern and now rotating back to the upside, making higher highs and higher lows. It's a pretty healthy trend and a stock that's making a new 12 month relative high uh, again this week. So overall, charts like that are in the financial sector. And, and I think that is one of the key themes that uh, I think a lot of people are underprepared for an extended period of time where something like financials outperforms something like technology. We have not seen that environment in many, many years. Uh, and I think in the last year, we started to see that. And I think we could see more of that. So I would, I would be thinking about how your portfolio may play out given a, a potential for a rising rate environment. If 10 year yields get to 2% or two and a quarter, what would that do to your current holdings? And at what point do you need to start to revisit some of those? I don't have Bitcoin on this chart. We're going to add it to the last chart. It, for a few brief moments, was certainly the top performance when it spiked above uh, previous highs, got above 65,000 for the first time, pushed up into the 66, 67 range, and then came right back down. And it, it gave back a lot of those gains Thursday into Friday and currently ended up uh, the week being the worst performer out of the five. Ended the week after a very volatile week down uh, about 0.9%. Uh, but overall, certainly the chart of Bitcoin is similar to the S&P in that it's testing uh, all-time highs. Uh, we can go there very quickly. And then, boy, we've got other stuff to cover. But the chart of Bitcoin is a really interesting one. From a technical perspective, we have round-tripped from 64,000 plus in April to 30,000 in July and August, or so June, July, and then rotating all the way back to retest those previous highs. So if we get above the previous highs and sustain them, if we hold those, you take the height of that pattern and that measures up to 90 to 100,000, depending on what levels you use to measure the height of that pattern, but certainly measures a lot higher. But that is a big grand if, which is can we get above the previous highs, which we did, but can we stay there, which we've not been able to do just yet. At this point, it's sort of hitting resistance and coming back, which is totally normal when a market tests new highs, when the market's overbought. Uh, you would see that in a lot of different uh, places. Where you don't see overbought conditions is with the S&P 500 chart itself. You can see that 
Uh, the S&P basically closed right at the, uh, at the September highs after closing right around there uh, yesterday. So we have reached the all-time high, and now we are sort of stagnating here for a, a brief two trading day period. The question for me, the number one question going into next week, do you see further upside? Do you see enough upside momentum, enough buying power to overwhelm any selling pressure, push stocks, uh, push stocks higher? In terms of what gets us there, it's interesting. The charts like Facebook and a lot of the growthy stuff, most of the fan mag stocks rotating lower today, it's the uh, cyclicals that are rotating higher. Let's quickly look at some of the themes just today, and, and then we'll go to uh, the uh, the the mindful investor live chart list to finish off our weekly we, weekly wrap segment. The S and P was down just a bit. The mid and small cap indexes were up just a bit, but that is just a bit is really the the theme there. They're all flat for the day essentially. What was not flat for the day was the Nasdaq 100 down almost one percent. So this is definitely a value overgrowth or a cyclicals overgrowth sort of story. And the VIX bouncing up a bit, but still very low relative to where it is uh, it has been. Ten year yields actually came off today, so the uh, ten year yield down around 166. The dollar index down just a bit as well. Commodities overall positive copper price is lower and that's where a lot of people have uh, have used that as an indication of uh, of economic strength the copper to gold ratio at times has been a really good measure of you know economic strength versus you know offense versus defense from an economic uh, conditions uh, but uh, gold and silver are actually positive today silver outperformed gold and i thought one of my favorite charts that miss schneider shared on wednesday's show if you missed it i would check that out on our on-demand platform she talked about that silver to gold ratio is a great measure of overall trend it's kind of surprising it's not one that i would looked at very often but uh, she has the evidence to back up why that's a decent thing to pay attention to cryptocurrencies mix mixed overall today and i think the real theme here bitcoin and ether are the two that i follow fairly closely and i'm asked, asked about fairly often both of them coming off but starting to hook higher a little bit in the last couple hours, my question over the weekend, do we get that uh, upside, uh, pull, you know, reasonable for Bitcoin to pull back from all time highs, Ethereum as well, which is coming off of all time highs, do we see a rotation back to the upside? Intraday today, it was financials and energy and consumer staples working. It was communication services really at the bottom of the list. Everything else is sort of flat, kind of choppy in the middle. So this is certainly a, a buy the financial, sell communication services kind of day, if that's a, a, a trade you would ever put on here. Let's continue on and look at the Mindful Investor live chart list. This is a live chart list that I keep updated on stock charts all the time. If you've never seen this before, you can access it through our articles page. Go to my page, which is called the Mindful Investor you'll see a link at the top of my blog that says live chart list. It will take you right to here. The market trend model is what we'll start with. My long-term model has been positive since June of last year and overall has remained very, very constructive. And that's about what this trend has been like. This has been a, a long and consistent, fairly consistent uptrend. And even with the last six weeks, which has been you know a pullback and a reversion back higher, the biggest drawdown we've had in the last year has been uh, has been six percent uh, year to date uh, in, in, is what I what I meant there, um, and so overall it's been a uh, it's been a period of uh, of overwhelming strength. The short term model remained positive today with the uh, with the S and P holding its uh, its its level from Thursday. The medium term model for me has been negative since May. That has told me to be much more uh, cautious about uh, particularly names that are breaking down and uh, and overall still has not turned a uh, a positive sign just yet. The daily S and P chart we talked about earlier. I don't want to belabor that anymore, but just uh, you know, next week it's all about whether or not we can get to new highs or really sustain a move above new highs. And these next couple charts are the ones I will be watching to gauge whether or not I have a strong conviction that that will happen. The first one's the cumulative advanced decline lines on four different universes. We have the NYSE at the top, large caps, mid caps, small caps. They are all very subjectively color coded orange, sort of a neutral color because I think they were, uh, for the most part, negative here in mid-September. This is when they were undercutting their August lows. This is when, uh, you know, uh, this is when they made a new swing low for the last three months. That was pretty significant. And, and so I turned many of them uh, red at that time. From there, we've seen a rotation back higher. All four of them have regained their 50-day moving average. What they've not done yet is get above the high that they set at the September market peak. So the S&P is retesting as high as these advanced decline lines are going back to the levels that they were at that September high. As I'm looking at the S&P chart, I'm also looking at this chart to see if the advanced decline lines go up because what that tells you is, is there enough participation, right? I think the, the, the likelihood of the S&P going materially higher from here is driven by 
the opportunity of individual names, the fact that individual names would be participating. The more stocks that are participating in that, the better. And I'd be looking at those advanced decline lines. Another one I'd be looking at is this chart, which is the percent of stocks above their 200-day and above their 50-day moving average. Just about three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, uh, at the end of September, this uh, reading was down to 25%, meaning three out of four names in the S&P were below their 50-day moving average. That's gone back up to 63%. So about 40% of the S&P, about 200 stocks in the S&P 500 were below their 50-day about two and a half weeks ago, and now are back above it. That is telling you that the conditions are improving. That line remaining about 50% and to continuing to increase would give me more conviction that the S&P is going to go higher from here. Finally, do we continue to see an expansion in new highs? In the last month, you've seen more and more members of the S&P and the New York Stock Exchange making new 52-week highs. The market continues to do well as long as these lines continue to go higher. Uh, we talked about sentiment la uh, yesterday. So if you miss that, I encourage you to go back to yesterday's show. But one thing I would call out is, both of the main uh, sentiment readings, uh, two of the three are, are in very, very close to euphoric uh, range, but not quite there. And that's something I would look for next week. The Rydex flows are literally at the lowest levels they have been in the history of the series, which goes back decades. It tells you individual investors in the Rydex family are all bulled up. Now, another place where you see some overwhelming bullish evidence, evidence is the last chart we have time for today uh, for this segment is the XLY versus the XLP, consumer offense versus defense. This is overwhelmingly tell you investors are on the offensive side of consumer. When, the, when this is going higher, I've learned to never be too negative. This is what's uh, you know told me to not be too negative in August and September. And it's telling me as this is broken to new all-time highs, while the S&P has not, this ratio to tells you that people are still very much on offense. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. A couple of quick comments before we get to the final bar mailbag. Number one, the way we get all of our questions that I'll be answering here momentarily are from all of you, from our viewers and our readers that send in questions. You can get to us via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. We put out great content every day on our YouTube channel called Stock Charts. Put a comment below the video that you're watching there. Any questions are fair game. Questions on technical indicators, on stock charts, on particular charts, ETFs, uh, stocks that you're looking at. We'd love to help point you in the right direction. Just let us know your questions. Email is best. The final bar at stockcharts.com. Also go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on-demand platform. It is free. It is really well designed. I'm super proud of our Stock Charts TV team for making our content from uh, myself and others look really, really good. They did an exceptional job designing it and keeping it updated. Great shows like The Final Bar and other special events like The Pitch, our year in review, our market outlook coming out in January, so much more. Go to StockChartsTV.com or search on any of the app stores on your mobile device for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Let's continue on answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. One more time, I'll tell you, email us, the final bar at stockcharts.com with your questions. Let's get to it. Question number one, can you talk a little about the meaning of AD and OBV divergences? I'm unclear on drawing conclusions on these divergences. And you very kindly sent me a couple charts. And as a reminder, when you send in questions, a screenshot of your chart is great. The other thing is right below all of our sharp charts, there's a permalink. There's also a permalink feature built into ACP. If you send that link in your question, then I'll know exactly what you're looking at. And I, I should be as well equipped as ever, hopefully, to, uh, to answer your question. So you're saying about the meaning of the accumulation distribution, which is AD versus OBV, which is on balance volume. On balance volume, just to give you a quick history lesson, on balance volume was designed, if I remember right, by Joe Granville, and he was a very esoteric but very knowledgeable uh, strategist in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he wrote a book called The Book of Granville, and uh, which is a fascinating read. It's very entertaining, but talked a lot about breadth and overall conditions and, and had volume in his work. And OBV, what it basically does is every day, if it's a positive close, you take that entire day's volume, and that's considered 
up volume. If, if the close is lower than yesterday, you can take that entire day's volume and that's down volume and you have a running total. So it's kind of like an accumulation distribution, but with the volume reading every day. Accumulation distribution, and again, the names I know are a little confusing, but here's the story. This is actually designed by Mark Chaikin, whose work we feature in a lot of places on uh, on, uh, on stockcharts.com. Chaikin Money Flow, uh, his advanced plugin on ACP are all really, really well designed, but accumulation distribution was his improvement to that kind of very simplistic on balance volume model. What that does is it takes into consideration the range. So depending on where we close relative to the high and the low, that's how much the volume is weighted. The reason why I gave you that background, I think that's going to explain how these can be divergent a little bit. So if you go down here, see some of these times where like accumulation distribution is going a little bit down, on balance volume is going a little bit up. And that all has to do with the actual days. So if we would have a big day and close at the highs of the day, the daily change in the on balance volume and the accumulation distribution are going to be very similar. But if you have a big move higher and then the close is right kind of mid range for the day, the accumulation distribution indicator actually weights that very, very low. So it really won't even move the reading, whereas the on balance volume will consider that entire day's volume positive. And so the OBV will go up. And that's probably what happened here is you had some big, you had some days that overall closed higher, but not by much. And there was enough volume in there to cause the on balance volume uh, or the accumulation distribution to uh, to not go up as much as the on balance volume, which considered that all bullish. So if you think about it, on balance volume is a very simplistic way. If you're looking at nothing else, I, I've found that to be a really good measure. If you want a truer measure of the momentum based on volume accumulation distribution or the chicken money flow, which is kind of a further improvement on that would be where I would look. But that's why you get divergence. It's all about where we close relative to the high and the low and the fact that those indicators treat those uh, things differently. Question number two, a great show. Always interested to hear what Katie Stockton has to say. And I would agree, she's fantastic. On her second chart, she commented on the cloud indicator. Maybe you could get into that on the next mailbag section to explain how to use it. I'm gonna do my best on, with limited time. And then I promise that uh, this is something maybe we can revisit uh, another time. So I'm gonna clean up this chart of Bank of America. I'm going to clean this out too on the bottom. I'm going to add the Ichimoku uh, cloud. And so when you go to overlays, you find two options, Ichimoku cloud and Ichimoku cloud full. We'll start with the cloud, which is basically what Katie was showing you on her charts. Now, what this is, this is a, a, a technical indicator that comes from Japan. It's actually a, a, a Japanese uh, indicator. It is uh, a very old indicator. It's been around for many, many uh, decades, if not centuries. And it is based on a series of uh, trend following tools. It's one of the few technical indicators that is actually designed to look forward. So it actually is plotted 26 days in the future. So it takes current moving averages, basically, is how I'll summarize it, and projects those. So the cloud actually goes out 26 days forward. So that's what's actually kind of interesting about it is you can see where a projected support and resistance range could be going forward. And in general, the way Katie uses it, which I think makes a ton of sense, bullish if you're above the cloud, bearish if you're the, below the cloud. And it's similar to looking at any sort of trend following device, right? You remain above the longer term trend, that's positive, you go below it and that's negative. What's interesting is it because it plots in the future, you get an idea of where things may be headed. Now, the real story is if you do the Ichimoku cloud full, you'll see all the indicators that go into that. So that, um, you know, that cloud is actually derived from some of these indicators that are on here. There are three different parts to the Ichimoku system. The cloud, which is plotted in the future, these two lines, which are called the conversion line and the baseline, the blue and the red line. And you look at when they cross up and down through one another, like the MACD. And then you have the lagging span, which is the current price plotted 26 days in the past. You use all three of those together to paint a, a picture uh, for uh, for the chart. And I've spent time on Japanese trading desks where all they use are candle charts with the cloud system, this whole Ichimoku system. And there's a lot written in Japanese. There's very little written uh, in English, but I would point you to writings by uh, Nicole Elliott, who's a, a British technical analyst, who's written some really good books on, uh, on Ichimoku Cloud. I feel like David Linton maybe did as well, um, but I'm going into my book history that is not readily, it's not something I've thought about in a while, but that's what I would look for. We'll vi revisit that again in the future. Last question, XLY versus XRT have very different charts. Retail is consumer discretionary. Jeans, boats, video games, candy, which we buy at retail stores. So what else is in consumer discretionary? It seems to me that these charts should be more similar. Really, really good question. I love your question, actually. And if we look at the performance chart and I put the XLY and I put, what was the other one? XRT, retail, uh, in here together, you can see that actually they're very, very different. So year to date, 
Here's the retail uh, sector spider here in blue. It's up about 39%. Here's consumer discretionary, the XOY, which is only up 14%. So what gives? What's the difference there? Here's the story. Two, two things that I would, I would point out to you. Number one, the XRT is actually an equal weighted ETF. The XOY is cap weighted. So a better way to make this comparison is probably to use like XCD, which is the um, equal weighted. Con no, that's not right. What is it? Um, X, oh boy, what is that uh, ETF? I'm blanking on what the equal weighted um, uh, RCD, I think that's it. But anyways, you'll, you'll get the picture. It'll be a little more similar. There's still a pretty big performance gap though. And the reason is because retail is actually just a part of consumer discretionary. Retail are the things that you mentioned, but there are a lot of other groups inside uh, consumer discretionary. Things like autos, right? Tesla, big internet names like Amazon is not considered part of that ETF or it's not a big weight. Amazon and, and Tesla and Home Depot, those three stocks make up about 45% of the consumer discretionary ETF. Those are not accounted for in the retail uh, ETF. Uh, and anything that would be is at very at most, it's going to be like 1% of it because it's an equal weighted ETF with about 50 stocks in there. So it's it's a very it's actually a narrower group within consumer discretionary than I think you may uh, you may recognize. I mean, the biggest holdings within the XLY are Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot, McDonald's, Nike. So I'm guessing Home Depot and Nike are probably in the XRT, uh, Lowe's, Starbucks, Target, Booking, BKNJ, General Motors, those are the top 10 holdings within the XOY. And only a couple of those would be in the XRT because the rest aren't considered retail stocks. So it is a good reminder, though, to it's sort of a caveat emptor, right? Let the buyer beware. Make sure when you look at something like the XRT, do your due diligence and look at the holdings of there. And also if it's equal weighted or cap weighted, because those can make huge differences in the uh, performance profiles. We need to wrap today's show, though. Thanks so much for those questions, everyone. Let's wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we were looking at the mindful investor live chart list. We talked about breadth. You know, when the S&P is facing a new all-time high at this point, it looks a lot like a double top pattern. And the question is, do we have enough gas left in the tank to propel us higher, if not much higher? And my guest yesterday, Craig Johnson, was talking about an upside target well above current levels or, you know, at least, uh, you know, a, a couple percent higher than where we're at, one and a half percent higher, I think. Uh, maybe a little more than that, if I remember. But what gets us there? It's the individual stocks that make up the S&P, right? That are able to propel the market higher. It's mid caps and small caps even that might be a part of that. So these advanced decline lines are what are going to tell you whether or not you have that upside participation. I, I'd argue in a condition like this, where the S&P is testing new all-time highs, you need these lines to be going higher. If the S&P goes higher and these advanced decline lines do not confirm those new highs, I would be very skeptical about the uh, possibility of the S&P going materially higher because this tells you that not enough stocks are participating. At this point, none of these have gone above their September swing highs yet. Chart number two is UNH. Actually, we were, uh, yeah, had a question about uh, UNH or came up earlier in the, uh, in the show. Didn't even mean that. This is uh, the UNH is one of the charts that I called out because it's making new highs. I screen every week, usually midweek. And again, over the weekend for stocks making new 52 week highs and 52 week lows, UNH struck me, you know, the healthcare sector, there are plenty of other actually very few stocks making new highs relative to uh, sectors like consumer discretionary financials, particularly industrials tech. That's where most of the new highs were when I when I looked on Wednesday, very few in healthcare, but UNH is one of those that's really powered through to the upside. Regardless of what sector a stock is in, if it's making new highs on improving relative strength, I'm going to be interested. And I'd love to see if that trend can continue. Can it hold above that breakout level? Not all is rosy. You had a bunch of stocks reporting earnings this week. Intel is one of those stocks that's been chart challenged. If you look at the last two years, you literally have gone nowhere. And I'm not exaggerating. If you look right now, we are at the same level we were in October of 2019. Not many stocks can make that dubious or very painful claim as Intel. Uh, and it reminds me, we're looking at something like Intel versus something like NVIDIA. One of those charts looks a lot stronger than the other. Intel has been a tough chart. It's not been a great stock to own. The fact that the relative strength is making new multi-year relative lows, yet again, the gap lower, a bit of a surprise. The fact that we've undercut the previous lows, I'm not surprised. And the fact that the relative strength continues to be weak is why I'm very much not surprised at all. So in general, go with stocks that are going higher, avoid stocks that are going lower and continuing that trend. That's not what's going to help you outperform. Folks, that is our show and a wrap for this week. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Good luck to our hometown Seattle Kraken with their home opener coming up tomorrow versus Vancouver. Go Kraken. Uh, from everyone here at stockcharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, be well. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.